Hello and welcome to Canaman TV. My name is Conor McLeod. In this very informative interview, I get the pleasure to talk with neuropsychopharmacologist and founder of research-based charity Drug Science, Professor David Nutt. In this interview, we discuss Professor Nutt's most recent book, Cannabis, Seeing Through the Smoke, the new science behind cannabis and your health, the dangers of ignorant legislation relating to drug use, medical cannabis in the UK, inhibiting factors holding back medical cannabis access, recreational substance use on a cultural level, current research relating to the medical use of psilocybin, and spirituality and the nature of human existence. Make sure to like and subscribe, and join me on Patreon, where you can help to build a stronger cannabis media platform for £3 a month. Now then, let's talk cannabis. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to chat with me. I'm aware you're extremely busy. Yeah, well, it's great to be finding another enthusiast who wants to share their, their enthusiasm and their, and their knowledge about medical cannabis. So thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. Um, so yeah, we're just briefly talking about your book there. What should we expect from it? Well, have a look at it. If you haven't seen it already. Uh, what I, I published the end of last year. It took me about a year to write. And um, it follows on from a book I wrote about drink, about alcohol, you know, two years ago, which a lot of people really liked it because it was the first time they'd read a, read a book about alcohol. They'd actually told the truth it went down the middle it didn't tell you it was good didn't tell you it was bad you know, and it wasn't to be about being sober or it wasn't about enjoying being drunk it was about making your own mind up so i thought time to do the same for cannabis and this is you know i'm very actually very pleased with it because I, i've uh, i've put it in a format which i think most people can understand there's quite a bit of science but you don't have to read the science chapters there's also quite a bit of policy about explaining how the difference between alcohol and cannabis, alcohol has been celebrated by politicians, cannabis has been vilified, and it's all political, there's no scientific basis for making those decisions. And then I give pointers to, uh, to where it might be used for medical disorders, and, and I ask how to deal with it if you've got problems yourself, etc. So I think it's a kind of comprehensive guide for the average person about cannabis and cannabidiol and THC and making sense of it all. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, still we're in this polarised position where we have individuals such as yourself who have this vast knowledge of cannabis and the industry basis behind it legislation and you go on the other side of the of the polarized spectrum and you have people who still refer to it as skunk and it has cannabis is one term for one substance there is no molecular breakdown that kind of thing i mean and on that note you've actually got a quote in your book um which is that you refer to there is a global revolution of cannabis going on i mean what would you say to people that are like they have no knowledge of cannabis and they, they would listen to that quote well, I would say, you know, that's, it, there is a revolution. The problem is Britain is off the pace. And that's so sad. British scientist Roger Pertwee in, in, in Aberdeen, he, was, he dis, was one of the pioneers of discovering back in the 70s in, endogenous cannabinoids. You know, we led the field scientifically and now we're limping at the back of the, back of the pack when it comes to turning it into medicines. And that's all because we have a puritanical, hostile view uh, to cannabis, which is completely unfounded. It's based on lies, it's based on fear, it's based on right-wing media wanting to attack people who use cannabis. And all that happens is that the people who need it as medicines get denied access, and people who use it recreationally get put in prison and punished. You know, both of the outcomes are completely unnecessary and completely pointless and hugely wasteful in terms of resources and in terms of justice. Sometimes when I think about the, the issue of cannabis prohibition, it reminds me of the old Shreddies, Shreddies advert, when you when you know when you had the multi-layers and it would be like the, there'd be one layer on top of the next layer and there's like seven layers all joined together to one, form, one little Shreddies pillow. And that kind of feels like that with cannabis. There's so many like variables which come, which come to result in cannabis prohibition. Absolutely, yeah. You're, I mean, it's a, you've got you know, the misinformation about what's in it, You've got drug laws which are completely inflexible. You've got people hiding behind the fact that the United Nations don't allow you to do things, which is completely ridiculous. I mean, the United, whatever the United Nations say, the Americans can ignore. And that's why you have 200 million Americans or more now having access to medical cannabis. And you've got probably about 150 million having access to recreational cannabis. This fact that, you know, the UN says it so hasn't, certainly hasn't ratified either yet. So, so there's, but it's about people make judgments based on prejudice and, uh, and in the end it's political judgment the government could just basically do what it should do and say okay let's be sensible about this let's remove it this let's basically 
decriminalize it, take it out of the schedules, let doctors prescribe without any of the constraints that come from it being... But yeah, just go back to that point there about the UK's sluggish like, tailing behind. Um, I think I read an article recently when it was referring to the influence that GW has had on the UK kind of trailing behind. Do you think that's had a significant impact? Well, I don't know. I mean, it is an, it's, it's an interesting question. So for people who don't know, GW is a, was a pioneering company. I mean, they really, they did take a great risk. They really went bankrupt. They started the first trials. And then they were thwarted because of that once they, even though they got evidence of efficacy and for instance, you know, they pioneered the use of um, this combination of THC and kind of a diet called Sativex in multiple sclerosis. But the government pushed them back. They, you know, they actually said, oh, you, it actually, you, can, you can use it for spasticity in multiple sclerosis, but not for pain because the pain data, they said, wasn't quite strong enough, even though we know, you know, cannabis is very useful for pain in multiple sclerosis. So they, you know, then they struggled on and they did some work with cannabidiol in epilepsy. And again, the government said, well, it's, we like the work, but we're not going to pay for it. Mm. But eventually the government did, did start paying. But what, what it highlights is, is the problem we have in this country, which is it, it, we think we're the best in the world at making decisions <laughs> for patients. We think we think we've got the best. Well, we've heard it. You've heard our prime minister say, you know, we have the greatest regulatory system in the world. And the truth is, it's uh, it's very good at what it does, but it's completely inflexible. And if you don't comply with their, their approach, they don't have any way of, of understanding or dealing with other kinds of data. So what happens is that people have to, you know, GW and other pharma companies would have to comply with this extremely expensive and complicated way of doing things without any guarantee that they can get paid. So mm. well, that's why there's no other research in this field, because most companies say, well, why would we spend 20 million pounds working up a project? You know, let's, let's not bother. Mm. And, and, so, and that is the problem. We need to have a much more flexible approach. We need to learn from other countries where there's masses of data of the use of medical cannabis in different disorders. Mm -hmm. So I don't completely subscribe to the view that the pharma industry is trying to, to, to um, stop access. Mm -hmm. I think the pharma industry is mostly just you know, basically given up thinking it can develop cannabis as an, in, in the way that the government wants it developed. Yeah. And, 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 and I think they're right. I mean, in Britain, we're very unusual. We do not have a single herbal medicine approved in this country. Not a, not a single pure herb. We have home, homeopathy and herbal medicines, but they're not approved in the same way as herbal medicines. You could come to like Germany has, has many herbal medicines. Right. Uh, and you think, well, you know, the German doctors aren't stupid, are they? I mean, you know, their regulators aren't daft. It's just that we essentially have a one size fits all mind. You know, it, it's not a pure substance. We are interested. Whereas, of course, you know, you and I and most people know that the entourage effect in medical cannabis is something that is likely to be really important. Mm -hmm. We're now seeing that with our, in our studies with childhood epilepsy, where the pure drug cannabidiol doesn't work, and the the plant extract does. So, you know, there's good evidence that the whole plant product is better, but our regulatory system just cannot accept that or won't allow it. That's kind of a, a really bizarre circumstance that's happened because the, with cannabis and, and, and the influence cannabis has had, you know, it's obviously prohibited over the years, but then it's emerged as this, this influence it's in such a diverse spectrum of, of areas of society. You know, it's like um, it's, nobody could really, I mean, what do you see happening in the next couple of years, medically speaking, in the UK? I mean, something's got to give, surely. Well, I do hope so, and I'm certainly pushing for doctors. Doctors need to say, okay, we've got evidence now. Look, there's a, a million and a half people using medical cannabis illegally every day. Uh, what we've got to do is convince doctors and the NHS that actually what they're doing is right. And it would be in everyone's benefit if we were, they were getting their prescriptions on the NHS. Now, one thing that my charity drug science has been doing is, uh, is to set up this um, database called 2021 it's an in, it's you go on the drug science website you can register for it uh, and you can um, be seen by specialists and if the decision is made that there are uh, no you know, you've got you meet the criteria for prescribing that you know, you've got an illness and you've tried other things that haven't worked you can get the prescription it's private unfortunately but mm. you've still got over we've got two and a half thousand people now in that database and we're looking at the outcomes and, and you know this is 
big studies. These are way, but in fact, this is quite interesting. We looked the other day, we have over a thousand people in our database with chronic pain. And that's a quarter of all the pain patients ever studied in the world with cannabis. <laughs> two years we've actually i mean it is so we have this enormous database and we're and we're and what we're doing is we're we're looking at the impact of their prescribed clinical cannabis on their pain which is doing well uh, on but also on their mood which is doing well and on their sleep which is doing well and on whether they're using other painkillers and we're discovering that they'll be able to get off other painkillers particularly opioids so this is a truly win-win it's a virtuous circle mm. you know people are doing better their quality of life's improving they're getting off other medications which potentially could kill them like opiates and yet the government isn't interested in this even though it would be an enormous almost certainly cost effective for the nhs it certainly isn't going to cost the nhs more it would probably save them money and the same with with you know with the children with epilepsy now we've got 21 children whose lives have been transformed by medical cannabis but only two of them and get the prescriptions on the NHS. The rest are having to pay. Mm -hmm. Just, it, it, we had a, um, a meeting in the House of Lords uh, this Tuesday. Tuesday just gone, and uh, one of the presentations there um, was from a guy called Ryan Zaffer, who works with me, my team, and works for drug science as well. And he worked out that a single night or day, a day in pediatric intensive care, costs f over five thousand pounds. And some of these children are intensive care 50, 100 days a year yeah. until they get on medical cannabis, then they're not there at all. But the doctors and, and the people who, who should be prescribing the medicine for them are saying, well, you can't prove that it works. And we say, of course it works. You know, they, you know, they're no longer in intensive care. What, what better proof you have than that? Oh, but maybe, maybe they just grew out of it. And, this, and we say, well, some of them actually, sometimes they run out of money and they can't pay the, the medicine anymore. And then they have seizures again. Mm. Oh, well, you know, there's a resist, there's an illogical resistance. But just the, just the, the cost savings from taking these children out of intensive care would pay many, many times over for the cost of their medication. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, like you said, that's 100% evidence in itself, but very often disregarded. Um, you did a, an essay recently, actually, and that's why doctors have a moral imperative to prescribe and support medical cannabis. Um, and obviously in that you detail um, the main points, which is essentially the, it's, it's almost common sense very often, you know, that it's like some of the reasons why they should be applying it because it's helping the patients, but it's because of this, this regulatory requirement for evidence. Um, there was two or three, what I noticed when I was reading. Not for thing. evidence, not for evidence, Connor. It's for a evidence that is provided in just one way. It's like saying, you know, there is, you, I don't know, you know, you might have five different foodstuffs, which are equally nutritious but the government only allows you to have one because 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 it it just cannot be bothered i think to get its head around the alternatives yeah Sorry, you were gonna say okay. no 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 it's on your go i mean to be honest the less uh, i speak the better <laughs> but no you were gonna ask me a specific question and something i said i think yeah. um yeah i think it was a uh, well, essentially there was there was two or three criticisms actually at the bottom from uh professionals uh, and i thought oh, it was quite interesting. sorry i haven't read it yet I haven't read that yet. I haven't got. I haven't got time to read what people what people write about me. What do they yeah, say? Yeah. I don't. Really... Yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the, what I found was quite interesting was what we're discussing here. This seemingly, it's not even seemingly, it's this ingrained knee jerk response to cannabis as a substance generally, without even regarding evidence and these kind of things. It's just kind of like a response of out of fear, and and I think it's unfortunately a compliment to the century of propaganda that everybody's been experiencing that's what that's that's what totally I, totally that's, agree with you and i think there's a particular problem in medical profession because medic doctors should know better yeah and doctors have been doing two things some doctors have been telling the world that cannabis is very dangerous when it isn't mm. and most doctors have been putting on blinkers they've been avoiding learning about the benefits of medical cannabis and now they're confronted with them. They don't want to admit they were wrong. Yeah. And, they, and, and I think there's a particular problem when patients come to them and say, I've worked out how to help myself. A lot of doctors think, well, hang on, I'm the doctor. You know, I know best. This paternalistic attitude yeah. is what, it's, it's kind of infantile and pathetic, but it, it, it pervades a profession. Many doctors, not all, but many doctors have this. And a lot of the, one of the problems we had was it only in this country, only specialists are allowed to prescribe. Mm -hmm. And 
they're the people least likely to be interested because specialists are usually old white men who spend quite a bit of time doing research on a particular topic in which they're the specialist. <laughs> and that is not medical cannabis. Yeah. So they've discovered that drug X is useful for these small group of people that they're specialized in treating. And, and then someone comes along and says, well, medical cannabis might be better. They don't want their, you know, the years or decades of research to be swept away like that. You know, they're defending their position of authority and, and knowledge. And, and so they're, I think this is sort of psychologically resisting, confronting the fact that actually could, <laughs> things could have been a lot better if they were more open-minded when they were when they were younger. And uh, yeah, so that's what that's, that's why so, we're now. Carry on. Sorry. No, no, that's what I was going to say. That's why I find that to be kind of like that the reference that I meant about the the Wheaties, uh, Shreddies thing, where it's just all these multi layers thing because it's it's really sociologically relevant if you think about the, the when you go in it's not just a case where it's prohibition or, or drugs issues and, and or the spirituality of an individual being free you're also dealing with this psychological barrier just on a personal level you are that's right and it's it's very complicated actually because sometimes if you if you have been denying access of patients for a long time to a drug as some of these doctors have been, some of these pediatric neurologists have been denying access to children who have now died. We know of two children who have died before they could get medical cannabis. Their parents couldn't afford it or they just couldn't get it in time. To admit that you were wrong about medical cannabis would be to admit that you were complicit in them dying. And that is both psychologically very disturbing for doctors who are trying to save lives. And also, you know, potentially it opens up to litigation. It won't, I don't think, but, but you know, they might feel that. And, and we have a very a stupidly defensive approach in, in medicine. Although we're an NHS and we're all working together. In fact, as you may have heard, I mean, I don't know, there was a panorama program last night showing how hospitals you know, in Telford were actually trying not to tell the truth about why things were going wrong. And, and that this, this, fear of litigation, the fact that medicine is now taken over you know, essentially by managers and lawyers and doctors don't have autonomy is another factor in why we're not making progress because we've got senior doctors, we've got specialists who want to prescribe, we've got specialists who say this is a revolution for my patients, the stuff they're getting on the private sector, but when they go to their hospital trust and say we should prescribe, trust say no, because the trusts are being run by managers and by um, and, and the drug budgets are controlled by pharmacists. And very often those budgets and um, the drug budgets are separate from the hospital budget. So even though prescribing medical cannabis would save the hospital hundreds of thousands a year, the case of you know, Lucy, the, the, who's um, one of our star patients, you know, she, Cambridge, University, Cambridge Hospitals Trust was spending hundreds of thousands of pounds a year keeping her alive until she started medical cannabis. Now that she hasn't been in hospital for two years, she, but they, don't, they won't prescribe her, her medicine because it's a different budget. Mm. <laughs> And it's this, this, this absurdity. And if any country should be able to see the bigger picture, it should be the National Health Service. But we've also we've structured it in such a way that, that actually it's a whole series of little fiefdoms that, and people fight to control their budgets. And there's no, it's not joined up thinking at all. I mean, do you see a acceleration of this, like the, the, uh, an untangling of this, like complicated legislation framework kind of thing over the next six months because of things like COVID and, you know, well, we're starting a, a trial of um, cannabidiol in long COVID. I mean, you know, why cannabidiol is a controlled drug at all is completely absurd. I mean, it's controlled because in the whole plant product, there might be a little bit of THC, but, but you'd have to take gallons of the stuff to have to get stoned. So, yeah, we've got to free up. The, the legislation is absurd. It's, it's archaic. It's not, it's not thought through at all. And, it, and it's all about prohibition. It's not about risk benefit. It's all about absolute prohibition. So yeah, we've got to change things. The economic value of changing and, and freeing up people to use medical cannabis would be crap vast. You know, I mean, it's been estimated what, over maybe a million people with long COVID? Mm. If medical cannabis would help those, that would be, that would be an amazing advance. Mm. So we should, we should be doing everything we can to facilitate access to medical cannabis for all sorts of reasons. But, and, and the biggest problem I think in Britain, well, one of the biggest problems is that we, control drug legislation in terms of control drugs is in the home office. The home office is a, a place that's just about policing. You know, it's not about health. Most countries at least agree that drugs are something to do with health, whether they're good or bad, and they put them in the health department. But until we get the intellectual control of drug policy out of the home office, we're always gonna be stuck in this, this prohibitionist nightmare.
Mm. What is practical to, to, to actually make that happen? Well, all that, ha- all that needs to happen is that the government, needs to, you know, the Prime Minister simply needs to say drug policy is going to be moved. And we're probably happy. You know, it used to be that the Home Office had both, uh, the, had sort of national security and it had the judiciary. You know, so when I was working for the government, you know, 15 years ago, the Home Office did everything. Then they said, oh, now we're going to have a Department of Justice. They just spit it off. They could completely, it, you know, it would need one, one letter from the Prime Minister to say that from now on, all drugs policy, the Misuse of Drugs Act is now going to be vested in the Department of Health. And, uh, and we then at least we would be talking to people that actually cared about patients. Because when you talk to the Home Office, they don't care about people, they care about stopping drugs. Yeah. Interestingly, when you just mentioned that about a minute ago there, about, um, about uh, outdated legislation, it reminded me of something that was actually Elon Musk was talking about, about the, the having an expiry date on legislation or policy, and, and how that is obviously something that would be, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Totally. Are you outrageous that the Misuse of Drugs Act has been going for over 50 years? A drug science, by the way, we're just, we're just putting the final touches to a book which looks back over the 50 years of the Misuse of Drugs Act and Next exposes one. the failure. But the fact that you haven't updated an act in 50 years tells you that you're actually, you don't really care about it. You don't care about the injustice. You don't care about the, the imposition on research. The Misuse of Drugs Act is one of, maybe, you, you know, you could potentially argue the biggest impediment to clinical academic research in Britain. I mean, it, it, the number of, it's not because it's not just cannabis. I mean, you know, all, lots of other drugs, MDMA, psychedelics, ketamine, they're all illegal and they all have medical value. And studying them medically is very, very difficult once they're controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act. So it's, it's been, it has had almost no impact. It's probably had a negative impact on drug harms, probably made them worse. But it has a disastrous impact on health. So when you when you uh, think back to your time in government, actually, because to be quite honest, uh, Professor Matt, you know when you're looking back, when obviously doing some research for the channel for the, for the conversation and looking on your life, it's kind of cool because it's kind of like, like I'm a big fan of things like determinism and, and those kind of existential concepts. And mm-hmm. your life kind of seems almost like a template for somebody that would be looking at that. If you think about what happened and then you, they, they, what, you know what I mean? Yeah. What's your thoughts on that kind of thing? Well, I, my thoughts are that... Uh, I think it, my thought is very simple, really. If you keep telling the truth, people will eventually listen. And you might not win all the arguments, but, you, but at, least you've, at least you've started a debate. And I, I, I think my sacking was in many ways the most, you know, very, probably the most significant event in my life in terms of having developing a dialogue with the real world about what I care about, which is helping people and you know, minimizing injustice and getting people out of prison, et cetera. So, so um, I think we're, you know, the fact you've got a TV channel looking at cannabis yeah. is uh, something that you could never have imagined, uh, you know, 15 years ago. So, I, I certainly couldn't have imagined that. I was at school. <laughs> <laughs> but the public, I mean, the point is, my sacking actually put the pub, put the drug debate into the public arena, yeah. and it stayed there, and it's growing and growing. So most people, most rational people, actually support the kind of positions that you and I take. The problem is most the country isn't run by rational people. Yeah. I don't I don't need to justify that, do I? I think that's obvious. No, that's like there's a big banner that says that somewhere. <laughs> um, it's interesting actually, just when you when you talk about that, because one of the things that's like that is absolutely it's apparent is the irony that's involved here. Like drug science is now the largest um I would say authority on, on real world scientific data when it comes to substance use. And it was obviously you know founded by yourself who was sacked for the very thing that and then now it's going to be seen that the government are going to be actually referring to you for information. That's 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 beautiful irony. Yes. Well it's it, it's it, it reflects the fact that um we, independence is free. But you know but but you say it's ironic but in fact in other branches of of government and advice it's the norm. So, for instance, you know, the, Dep- the Centre for Fiscal Studies basically ev- evaluates government policy on, on money. That's an independent organisation. The Bank of England adjudicates independently on interest rates. The only branch of government where you don't have a, a truly independent adjudicator is drugs. And that's kind of, uh, so there's that vacuum into which drug science has, um, has sort of been sucked and is hopefully playing a good role. Well, that brings me back to the determinism thing, because without your sacking, this circumstance wouldn't be put in place. And then it was kind of, it kind of scratches the head thinking what that would be like right now, because drug science is, is, you know, really significant in, this, in the space. 
Yeah, I do think about that. I mean, I suppose if I carried on for, as I could have done for nine years, I did one year before I was sacked, it would have been very painful. I, 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 I mean, something, something had to give. <laughs> You know, it's, you know, it's either either the government changed or I changed. I was never going to, you know, I couldn't change because I'm a scientist. You know, I have to tell the truth. I have to say what I believe. Could they have changed? It could have. It would have changed probably if if the conservatives weren't so cynical. To the Lib Dems wanted to change. I mean, you know, let's remember. You know, I, I was quite positive. After, even though I was sacked, we we did have a Lib Dem drugs minister, Norman Baker. Mm. Four years he tried to he went around the world he looked at policies in other countries he wrote a report he was not allowed to publish his a minister was not allowed to publish his own report because the home secretary Theresa may said you cannot publish this so he resigned you had a, a minister resigning because the tory part of that coalition government wouldn't let him tell the truth about his drugs so it was the, it, unfortunately that, co that coalition government they made the, they made the wrong deal with the tories the lib dems if actually they i think they had four key things and if they'd had drug reform as one of them i think things would have changed they unfortunately they didn't yeah there was also quite a funny quote where i think it was um you were arguing with somebody and it was you'd you'd used the to, to show how relatively harmless cannabis as you'd said that most or, or i think it was the the context of um horse riding 100 yeah. deaths from horse riding to 30 deaths from ecstasy in that year which i thought yeah. was quite comical <laughs> you know horse riding is such a abstract form of dying really if you ever speak to anyone who rides horses ask them if they've known anyone who's died falling off a horse and they all will yeah in fact I, I... <laughs> after, after i published that article uh the uh, the national magazine for horse riders horse and hound they stopped i think or was it the inventing magazine anyway they used to have an annual list of people who died they stopped doing it now because because actually just so many people die horse riding that they um they don't want to scare people off it oh i see oh, i see i thought they actually they stopped publishing it because of your comments i thought that's what you were going to say there <laughs> no they stopped publishing it because my comments were right that actually horse riding is more way more dangerous than ecstasy or yeah yeah and the thing is you could probably apply a lot a lot of those things to a lot of different things how many people have died from peanut butter how many people have died from you know chewing gum things like that you know yes is that it's yeah i mean that, getting a proper metric of death is uh is something that you know i've always been interested in that's why that's why i got sacked because Basically, we came up with a, a really the, the most sophisticated and detailed and transparent way of assessing drug harms has ever been. And when you do that, you discover that cannabis is an example of tobacco and way less harmful than alcohol. Governments don't want to hear that. Governments don't want to hear the truth. Drugs, basically, drugs are useful political weapons for, for getting elected, from controlling the press. Drug policy is based on scientific evidence. In almost any, no country in the world is it completely transparent i suppose portugal is probably getting closest yeah um but is portugal kind of like a shining example is everybody what people say about portugal is it accurate totally i mean you know at least portugal doesn't put people in prison <laughs> for using drugs yeah. and i'm pleased to see that scotland is going the same way which is great news yeah. you know and the, point, the worst thing you can do to someone who's using drugs person you know who's not dealing with using drugs is to give them a criminal record because then the only job they can get is dealing drugs you know I mean, you can create the market i mean it's so obvious and it's not just people like me saying that i mean nobel prize winning economists have said this mm -hmm. but governments do what the media want them to do they do what they're generally what they're very hostile puritanical right-wing supporters want them to do yeah Sad thing about drug policy, though, even in, in many countries, even left wing governments, left wing poli politicians are, are also anti drugs. You know, you've got the drugs are in this, they're sort of, they're between a rock and a hard place. They're between the people that are Puritans uh, and hate, you know, moralistic and hate drug use because you're, a you know, you're a bad person. And then you, on the other side, you've got the left wing groups who actually want to control what people do. Mm -hmm. And that uh, a sad example of that was recently, you know, the recent Nor Norwegian. Um, referendum to make cannabis legal again the left wing opposed it because they you know they're they're, they're, you know, they're kind of essentially i suppose you know controlling sort of rather stalinistic you know they want to tell people what to do what to believe they don't want people making choices for themselves mm -hmm. and drugs as you know i mean the use of drugs recreationally is really about individual choice i've actually answered it perfect you should say that because i've actually i've written that down here would you say that drug consumption is synonymous with freedom well, yeah, 
<laughs> unless you get arrested and put away <laughs> <laughs> but just just the, just the notion of being able to consume into your own body you know it's like freedom of person kind of thing of course yeah i mean it is it is i mean i i i, I would certainly dissuade people from taking drugs that are going to kill them yeah, I of course. Have the right. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm in favour of people choosing when to die, and you know, yeah, and drugs, you know, necessary for that as well. Yeah, of course. And yeah, the state shouldn't def- shouldn't control what people put into their bodies, unless what they, by doing so you add an enormous burden to the state. Mm. And that's why we should focus on alcohol because that's where the big burden is. Yeah, yeah, and big damage, big damage as well. That's the point. That's where the the costs. You know, alcohol is way the most. Did you see you have, this morning? SHAP, the Scottish Health Alcohol Program, just put out some new data. With uh, deaths from drink driving, have the proportion of driving deaths, which people are drunk, has now reached an eleven-year high. Right. Um, yeah, nationally, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, very interesting actually, because a lot of the criticisms for cannabis seems to be now arriving as the fact that they say, "Oh, yeah, it impairs your driving." You know, it's like caffeine also can do that. Well, well, caffeine probably makes you a better driver. Yeah, caffeine. that was a poor example. <laughs> there is a, there's other substances which you can have with large amounts, which could potentially inhibit cannabis. your ability to drive. Yeah, I mean the thing is, the ev- whether cannabis have, in, it contributes to road deaths is a moot point. No one knows. I mean, you know, it prob- if you're really stoned, yeah, you probably you know you're more likely to crash. But whether actually the number of deaths attributable to cannabis is very low because often people drive more safely, more cautiously. And yeah. um, what what's happening in some countries, and what we and in, in this in this country as well, we we set limits of cannabis in salivary testing and driving, which have got nothing to do with driving skills, but are there to catch people who've used cannabis. So that most of, actually most of the drug driving laws are about punishing people for drug use, not protecting people from dr- drug drug drivers. It's actually quite despicable, really. Because they're not calibrated to the harms of alcohol, so we let people drive with a level of alcohol which is more impairing than any of the drugs that we test for. Yes, it sounds it feels kind of malevolent. It's direct. No, absolutely, it's punishing drug users, and, and it's explicit. I think Theresa May, who brought it in as Home Secretary, would have said, "Yeah, we want to use it." Well, she, in her mind, she knows that she knew that this was about punishing drug users, but it was manifested or sort of packaged as let's protect the public for these dangerous people on drugs which because what she did when she had her own independent committee the wolf committee which made sensible recommendations that i endorsed drug science endorsed and then they said oh yeah well these thresholds which are sensible we're going to reduce them all Mm. so that it's easier to catch people because we want to punish people What do you make of the most recent uh, statements from Boris Johnson about, I think it was people that have been um, prosecuted for drug use still get their passports taken from them? Well, that, as I said at the time, and the majority of the Tory front bench wouldn't be able to travel then, would they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it is, well, I, I think what he was saying was actually, we won't give them criminal records, we'll do, because in Portugal, what they do for, for drug possession is that they, 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 put, they have sort of, a kind of rehabilitation approach, you know, they kind of encourage, they have civil sanctions rather than criminal sanctions. I mean, all in favour of reducing, getting rid of criminal sanctions. Um, but, uh, yeah, frankly, I think that's just a, a bit silly to, but, to take away people's passports. Most of the people they're going to prosecute probably don't have passports at all. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. And most of the people that will be prosecuting, they'll be travelling just down the street to somebody's house that will not wearing a passport. Exactly. Um, exactly. If we're to just sidestep away from uh, kind of the side, uh, kind of, I was going to ask you about, what's your thoughts on the response from psilocybin when psilocybin's ingested medically? Well, I think it's a revolution, but I'm biased because that's our research, so I'm a bit... Bi- yeah. But I think we're transforming psychiatry with the use of psychedelics and cannabis, but psychedelics work in a different way, of course. Psychedelics produce a profound alteration in brain function, which can be liberating. People can escape from depression or addictions. Mm-hmm. Cannabis tends to be taken on a regular basis as to kind of control symptoms. And that's because the system works in very different ways, as, as you and your, uh, your viewers know, that cannabis works on the endocannabinoid system, which is a chronically active system that is always working to, um, it's called an adaptogenic system. It produces homeostasis in the brain. Psychedelics produce a powerful perturbation and they break repetitive negative thoughts. So they work in a quite a different way. 
they're very complementary in that sense. You know, you've got two approaches to tackle most problems now. So, I mean, where is the research standing at the moment? Because I've got a real interest in psilocybin and psychedelics in the context of essentially like archetypes and symbology and, and, and humans' mm -hmm. connection to the nature of meaning and how these substances seem to exacerbate mm -hmm. the need to discuss those things. I mean, um, it, it can, it's, you know, I think so? Exacerbate, uh, exacerbate usually as a negative. As it, oh, so apologies. I, I kind of encourage, encourage, yeah, encourage, yeah, to encourage, encourage. The, encourage the use of these things. Um, you know, what, what, what do you feel about that kind of thing? Do you think it's uh, just a, as, as are humans pre? I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. One of the was amazing, the guy that uh, one of the pioneers of of LSD, which is actually the guy that gave LSD to Aldous Huxley, because Huxley started off using mescaline, and then, then he moved to LSD, and uh, the guy that gave it to him. Um, so I called Bill Wilson, and Bill Wilson was a founder of AA. Alcoholics really? Anonymous. Yeah, uh, and Bill Wilson overcame his alcoholism through a, a psychedelic experience. And Bill Wilson was so AA was so powerful in, in the in the fifties and sixties. They got six trials of LSD for alcoholism funded in America, and the size of the effect, the treatment effect, is twice, at least twice that of any subsequent treatment for alcoholism. And Wilson was very interested in the psychological experiences. People see you know, what he said basically was that LSD could allow alcoholics to see a world where they didn't need alcohol. They were bigger beyond alcohol. There was more than, you know, alcohol wasn't their life. There was much more to life. And he was very interested in this, um, this concept of, of kind of accessing archetypal uh, constructs and images. So he wrote to Jung, of course, he was the, you know, the, the father of this con these constructs. And uh, unfortunately, Jung was, um, was dying at the time. And, didn't said he didn't really think it was necessary. You could get get access to your archetypes through dreams rather than through psychedelics. But I think I think uh, Wilson was right. I think uh, th th they do allow the your brain to go somewhere where it uh, what used to be when certainly when you were a child, and maybe it you know it does therefore allow you to access things which modern life, modern education, modern thinking kind of it's. It, precludes or at least dampens down you know access to feelings and, and to a sense of being more than just a, a, the individual we've a lot of people and i think you'd agree we, we, modern society has atomized us we're, we, there's so much focus on the individual you know you know we're more and more of us are living alone more of all of us are actually communicating through yeah. screens rather than so this atomization of life is something that is definitely not good for a lot of people's mental well-being and, and, and psychedelics can open up and encourage people to get back together in a, in a more positive way I think. See, the thing that makes me believe that it kind of psychedelics touch on something that's much more empirical than just a, a metaphorical symbol or something like that is that what you described there is like that we're all being atomized so if you look at um, Far Eastern uh, thinking of like um, the I Ching and, and, and like um, and, and the Tao which says that we are all and when we're all individual and in the, in the flow of these things, you know, that, that I don't know, it just there seems to be some kind of um, um, maybe synergy between that level of thinking and the psychedelics. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, there's, they're speaking the same language, no doubt about that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, um, you can get to that state through like 30 years of meditation or 30 minutes of psilocybin. Yeah. Now, I think psilocybin is going to be more useful in the longer term. <laughs> it's, almost, it's the fast food approach, essentially. Well, yeah, but I don't want to, dis don't want to diminish it yeah. because for most people, it's actually for, in that, this particular sense that the, the journey isn't necessary. It may be useful, but it isn't necessary because it, it seeing, seeing reality, seeing, seeing, a, seeing the world you want to be in, it's probably better to get there in your 20s than in your 50s, I think. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know, soul searching is relevant every time of life, I think. No, but I'm saying you don't want to wait to your 50s. All right. No, I certainly I mean, not. I mean, I mean, if you're going to spend 30 years trying to get insights, that, if you're going to do it through meditation, that it takes a very long time to be able to meditate to a point where you can begin to escape from the Western world, whereas psychedelics can do it very quickly. And I think that's why they're hugely powerful. That's why they're way more powerful than... And, um, psychological approaches like mindfulness for depression is mm -hmm. because a depressed people struggle to do mindfulness for biological reasons and b you know it takes 30 years to get over your depression well that's a terrible waste if you can overcome it within a day with a psychedelic yeah 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I really do. I find these things really uh, fascinating. I mean, where do you see the direction of the, the research going in the near future? Well, we've started trials in um, anorexia, and we're starting a trial in um, OCD next uh, next month or so, and then we're going to look at people with chronic pain. So, it's going to. This is this is a burgeoning field. This is one of the most well. This is the most exciting uh, innovation in in psychiatry in the history of the world, and it's also hugely important in neurology. We're starting a trial of non psychedelic psychedelics to help people recover from stroke, because we now know from research recent research that the psychedelic drugs can facilitate not just reor helping you reorganize your thinking but also laying down new thought processes and those laying those processes are laid down by um, increasing synaptic connections increasing the number of nerve connections in the brain and that can help in stroke that people have shown in, in certainly in animal models that you can accelerate recovery from stroke with psychedelics because you can regrow the brain faster. You, you can it facilitate brain growth. So we're going to do a trial within the next year in people who have had a stroke. Excellent. That's, that sounds brilliant. That's, that's uh, unfortunately my next door neighbor, unfortunately, just two years ago had a stroke. So I'm aware of the damage and impact that they can have. You know. it's, it's conceivable. It's unlikely, but it's conceivable. It could work even after, a long time after stroke. We are, you know, we're going to see if we can get... Um, the treatment into people within weeks of having a stroke. If that works, then I think you know we could then begin to look to see if it could help people, even if they've been um, been you know, you know, ill for many years, because the the process of regrowing is stimulated by the drug, mm -hmm. and it will happen, I think, irrespective of you know how long. I mean, it might not happen in the part of the brain which is dead because of the stroke but it will happen in the parts of the brain around that and maybe who knows mm -hmm. we know certainly in, in children even severe strokes can be remedied people kids can overcome the stroke deficit you know, many years you know you know over many years if as their brain can overcome it so that's because their brain is plastic and growing but maybe if you could encourage the same plasticity in adults then maybe they could so you know i think there's even hope for people who you know had a stroke a long time ago but that's time will tell that's really interesting you say that about the, the brain obviously being plastic essentially because this is obviously a counter to what people used to think 30, 40 years ago was just mm -hmm. you came to a certain stage of development and that was it. Um, do you think there's anything peculiar about the nature of, of psychedelics? Or do you just think they're just kind of like, a, it's just, a, you know... Um, what do you mean, why do they work when the brain, why doesn't the brain do its own thing? Do, why can't the brain... No, I think more along the lines of because these these chemical compounds can obviously alter things such as like medical issues, but at the same time, in, in the in most extreme form of consumption, they could take you to a realm that's indescribable. That seems, it's kind of like a, a peculiar substance to be able to do such a, 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 you know, it just seems kind of peculiar. I fully understand what you're saying. I think it's, well, there are, I think there are two, two, two answers to that. The question is that most people ask a slightly different question. Most people say, why the hell do mushrooms make this stuff? <laughs> it's so interesting to humans and the answer is we don't know yeah. and some people think mushrooms have been put on earth by some <laughs> extraterrestrial being to to educate humans you know yeah. uh, i don't subscribe to that theory but i can't disprove it um some people think mushrooms make it to to make deter insects from eating them i don't know idea uh, but it could be true um i frame the question differently i frame the question is why is the brain full of receptors that the stuff from mushrooms or from peyote or from ayahuasca can produce such profound effects and i think it's it must be telling us something about what the brain is about so i suppose the simple answer is i think that the targets of psychedelics are systems in the brain which are particularly important for understanding and for thinking and for planning and for you know making sense of things and because the receptors they work on are in the parts of the brain which do that do those processes and I think those receptors are there in humans in huge density. We have the highest density of these receptors of any other known uh, animal. And I think it's because they're there, that's why we are so good at understanding and making changes and planning. And, and so, for instance, you know, when the first person to discover, discover how to make fire, that was, an, that was transformational for human society. But the important thing was that not only that person discovered how to make fire, but he also discovered the importance of it and then the communication of it to other, other members of the tribe and other tribes. So it's, it's, it's being able to see the bigger picture 
And that's, of course, what psychedelics do. Psychedelics turn on that system and you see a bigger picture, even, even without having to make a major discovery yourself. Hmm. So you could say that, I mean, because sometimes when I'm, obviously when I'm listening to that, all I can think is this unity, this unifying element of, you know, nature creates this, you know, wide landscape of things that, that exist and they all integrate in this harmonious direction. It seems that if we were to go far enough away from, if we were to get, get a far enough bird's eye view, we'd be able to see we'd all slowly progressing towards one direction and each direction, you know, the direction is made up of our collective behaviour, actions, you know. Yes, indeed, absolutely. I mean, that's the great hope. The problem is that they don't work in all of the brain, and a lot of the brain is about doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of the brain is doing different things. A lot of the brain is about, I mean, the reality is, you know, if we want to talk about what the brain is, you can read my other book. Where's my other book? Here you go. This is, if you want to understand the brain, yeah. read the book, Brain and Mind Made Simple. I definitely will be buying that, definitely. So, the brains, the purpose of the, the orig origins of brains are very simple nerve, nerve, nervous system, neural nets, nerves to produce movement. Movement is essential in animals to get food. So the first purpose of the brain is to get food. The second purpose of the brain is to get got nutrients, water, and then have sex and reproduce. So basically, that's what the brain started off doing. And actually, it's what it's very good at. You know, very few of us die because we're not hungry. <laughs> you know, we get hungry, we go and find food. So, so the brain at one at a very simple level has a very, very limited um, range of of, um, of 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 objectives. Now, the human brain and well, you know, lots of other animal brains has become enormous. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that massive growth of the cortex has led to consciousness and consciousness is, as humans have is other species also have a kind of consciousness which we can define as self-awareness so dolphins have it elephants have it and uh, and that means that you wouldn't have a sense that, you, that you're an individual yeah that you and you maybe you have autonomy you make, make decisions in between that between the drive for food and sex and this very high level there's a whole you know, le there's your shreddy levels of things like emotions and memory and behaviors and that. Now, most of those are kind of semi-automatic. And, and, you know, so things like aggression and love and that, they're all programmed below the level of sort of conscious thought. Uh, and so most of what the brain does is essentially without us putting a lot of effort. In fact, in a way, you look at the dogs, dogs are the highest of the non-conscious species and dogs have a very structured life. You know, they've got the right range of emotions. They defer to authority. They behave as, as groups. They defend the group against others. You know, they have, they have a very structured society. They don't abuse each other, etc. What's happened with humans is that because we've got a very big brain, we start manipulating uh, the bits of the brain which used to be programmed to do things kind of appropriately for our species, and we start manipulating them. So we we create leaders that are inappropriate and become greedy. And, and so our brains distort the human potential. And I think you're right. I think psychedelics give us an opportunity, at least for some people, to see the other side of that, to see the part, to activate the parts of the brain which allow, allow us to see. And actually, our brains are quite often not doing what's, what's actually good, certainly not good for society. It might be kind of seemingly good for us. But a lot of, you know, a lot of the selfishness in life actually isn't good even for the person who's selfish. I think the thing that fascinates me so much is sometimes you can have people who are 100% atheistic and they'll have a huge uh, uh, consumption of like psychedelics and then their whole life view changes. Um, another thing you mentioned about as well, about the, the, the human neural network, another thing that I find relatively peculiar is the human neural network is so similar in its appearance to the mycelium network, which is also similar to the, the you know, which is also similar to the, to the artificial intelligence network, which is used essentially behind the internet. These are strange... Mm -hmm similarities which and not only that if you were to get the farthest away picture of, of like a, a, a the solar system or something like that, you see it there as well it's a very it's a very peculiar well i think there are yes you're right i think you know i think networks are a key part of processing information you're right and it's kind of quite likely that in it well in the same way as there have been at least three separate evolutions of the eye because seeing things requires a certain combination of of skills or, or, or uh, attributes or 
proteins or whatever. In the same way, understanding or, or, or communication, these networks. So yes, I think networks are quite likely to, to, to optimal networks probably do share, share our own commonalities. But I suspect actually, I suspect the human brain is better than the mycelium. And it's probably actually better than the, um, than the solar system or the, you know, the space. Because we can see beyond, you know, we can see the others. I'm not sure the mycelium can see us. Yeah. No, um, well, you never know. You never know. <laughs> well, I, I'm pretty, I'm okay. You never know, but I think it's unlikely we will um, ever know. <laughs> yeah, no, what I doubt, I highly doubt that. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. But no, well, let's say, Professor, no, we've essentially covered most of the things I want to talk about. Um, do, do you have anything else you'd like to discuss before we go on? Well, no, I just want to tell people about drug science. You've kindly let me mention it. It's a charity. Uh, it is the only, it's the best place in the world. The web, Dr. Times website is the, the best place in the world to get information about drugs and drug policy. And also, if you need medical cannabis, you can get it through the drug, that website. Look on the 2021 page. Do follow drug science. Um, if you can afford to become a community supporter because that helps us. You'll get signed copies of my books then for free. Uh, and uh, follow me on Twitter and just keep campaigning because uh, if we, are rational about drugs they can transform the world in many different ways not just medicine but also in terms of helping people understand themselves better and if you want one book to read read island by aldous huxley because that is to my mind the uh, the blueprint for society the problem is well you read it and then we'll talk about it another time Without a doubt, I'm, I'm delighted you'd mentioned that because I've actually had that mentioned to me before because I went at the end of me essentially spending 90 minutes boring somebody about Brave New World and, uh, and the, the, <laughs> that kind of thing. So the island, I've actually never read it, but yeah. It is, it is this, it's, his, it's Huxley's last book. And he puts together in a beautiful way with a, with a sad reality at the end, which I won't tell you now, um, a beautiful way how you can use psychotherapy education, dance, theater, and psychedelic drugs to create a blueprint for a rational, yeah, an optimal society. It's a beautiful book and it's, it's, it's you know, it is, uh, it's so ahead of its time. Most people hate it because it talks about psychedelics. I mean, I've been abused. I, I mentioned it when I, I was on the BBC um, radio program, a good, a good read a couple of years ago. And I then went to give a, a presentation to a, a group of uh, addiction psychiatrists and some of them shouted at me for daring daring to mention an illegal drug on the bbc i, I mean come on guy you know I mean, if this drug cures alcoholism well let's use it yeah exactly so read island it's a wonderful book without a doubt i will but just unfortunately because you've mentioned it they just briefly mentioned it before but oh uh, huxley and his book brave new world he talks about no it wasn't actually i think it's those of perception he talks about the mind at all I think, or mind at large, I think he refers to it yeah. as, is this, this overarching consciousness that lives in the universe. What are your thoughts on that? Are you 100% atheist, or do you believe that there are realms of, you know, I find this stuff, you know, philosophy of mind, it's really fascinating. Well, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, but I'm definitely spiritual. Yeah. So yeah, what is it, agnostic? Is that what they call that? No, no, no. I mean, you know, it depends what you mean by God, but there's no question, you know, there, there's more, so the idea that any individual human brain yeah, is complete is a word. Mm. <laughs> no, I think I broke up there. Yeah. Uh, lovely to you, Connor. Did you yeah, get that? Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't. What did you say there? I broke up. Did you get the last bit, my last final comment about the idea that any individual human brain is in any sense complete is absurd. So that's a good point to end, all right? <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I'm, I'm all right with that. So let's What's see your background, you. by the way? How come, we, what, is your background in science or? Uh, my background? Um, no, my background, I think, is just I've, I've always had like a really inquisitive nature about things. To be honest, Tristan, I'm actually sp spending most of my days now figuring out that I think that this is what's that we're all guided towards something because it seems to be that there's been almost like a domino effect that's and being in my life that that's essentially led me to where I'm at right now so essentially I, like that's why I touched on consciousness a minute there I'm a, what, I've, what I believe now as a person is I believe in things like manifestation that, that you can there's a consciousness that there's almost reciprocal with the individual and universe and it sounds bizarre because there are tragedy and there are things that are terrible but I think this is a, a narrow perspective that humans kind of apply to 
Like it's almost like an anthropomorphic element that's applied to something that's that's too close to home, you know. And and I think very good way, very good way of putting it. I agree, absolutely. You know, and and I think that's why. So my background, I think, is just essentially in studying life, and that's why I'm kind of touching on things like when you mentioned like Carol Jung and all these different perspectives of human. We're in a we're in a really transitional stage, I think, not only when it comes to cannabis, but I think as a species, and I think technology is putting us putting us in a place that's we're kind of accelerating oh, yeah, well, something. Well, yeah, I mean, we've got to make a mind up very soon or the robots will take it. I mean, they, it's going to be hard. To, once they start, we're never going to get them back. So yeah. <laughs> you know what, actually, now or never for humanity. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Now or it's brain. <laughs> it's funny you should say that, actually, because I do, like, obviously, I said before about the animation, and I do, like, I've got comic books and stuff like that. I actually have a running cartoon that goes on my head, and I should really put it down where that's all I picture, is that the humanity is totally destroyed, and the last remnant of human existence is nothing but a video recording of somebody on the YouTube. <laughs> You know, know, just flicking in the middle of us in, in the field or something. I don't know. I think you're probably right. I mean, sadly, I think you're right. Yeah. I, I, I'm with Hawkins on this. I, I cannot see how we cannot in, end up being subservient to the to robots if, if, unless we do something which humans haven't been good at doing up till now, which is actually set up some real rules for humans, it's humans rather than you know selfish individuals who just can't be asked to. Look out, think about themselves. I, f- I find that bizarre, though, as well, that we're walking, to, we're essentially walking ourselves towards our own enslavement, and it started from the wheel all the way through. So it makes me do think it's like, what is it's, it's very peculiar being a human, you know? It is, it is. And uh, well, maybe there is a higher purpose. <laughs> but sometimes there, there certainly seems to be this. I, I have, maybe I, God is a robot. I don't know. Thanks to Professor Not for giving me his time, and thanks to you for sticking around until the end of the video. I sincerely hope you enjoyed the content. I'll see you next time.